Now to, uh, to get things kicked off, let's welcome the OpenStack Foundation COO, Mark Collier. Hi. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. So uh, how many of you are here at a summit for the first time? Let's see a show of hands. All right, this is amazing. Well, it, as you are filing in and getting your badges, you're probably looking around and going, who the heck are these people? <laughs> and what are they doing here? What am I doing here? Um, so to put it, to put it really simply, uh, we are a community of people who build and operate infrastructure. But what's really special about this community is that we build and operate open infrastructure. And we're going to have a lot of time, like any tech conference, where we're going to hear about what's being built, what the tools are, the open source projects. We're going to hear from the people building them. And that's going to be awesome. We're going to be hearing about that throughout the morning. But I want to start off by dedicating this keynote to all the operators out there, the people that actually operate the open infrastructure that we all rely on every day. I have so much respect for these people. They are doing amazing work to put all the stuff that the communities are building into action, into practice. You know, those of us uh, may not realize it every day, but we are relying on the stuff that they do, the infrastructure they operate. And we're talking about planes, trains, and automobiles. And sometimes we need all three to get where we're going. Now, some of you are too young to remember this movie, but that's okay. It's really good. It's called Planes, Trains, and Animals. Okay, let's move on. Uh, now, this infrastructure, this open infrastructure, is being operated all over the world. And so these operators, in my view, are really starting something special, a movement around open infrastructure, and it's happening all over the planet. And the types of problems they're solving for us are really inspiring in my mind. So we have, for example, the Ontario Institute for Cancer Research right here in Canada. They have a thing called the Collaboratory, in which they're combining a lot of different open source technologies to power their infrastructure, which then empowers the scientists who are in search of a cure for cancer. You may recognize the center photo as the CERN Large Hadron Collider. They are an amazing pioneer, not just in science, but in computer science. You know, for 30 years, I feel like if you want to know what's the future of infrastructure or just the future of technology in general, find out what CERN's running you'll probably be running it in a couple of years. Last but not least, the Square Kilometer Array. This is um, a multi-decade project to build the largest machine in human history. And it's actually going to be able to look deeper into space than any, any other instrument we've ever built in humankind um, historically. And it's all made possible because of open infrastructure. And so beyond research, we also have other ways in which our everyday lives are empowered by open infrastructure. Uh, retailers, large and small, that we, that we are all familiar with, banks, and of course, insurance companies. And in fact, Progressive is someone we're going to be hearing from in just a few minutes. Now, the reasons people embrace or are drawn to open infrastructure as a strategy vary. So people have different reasons, right? Um, we, all, we often hear cost and compliance. So, I mentioned the Ontario Center uh, Institute for Cancer Research, and you know, they, are, they have told us that they're able to actually operate at 40% less uh, expensive infrastructure by using open components. And the compliance landscape, let's face it, is more complicated than ever. I mean, any of you that do business in Europe probably have concluded by now that GDPR is, in fact, a four-letter word. And of course, there are many other forms of compliance, but that's the one that people like to make fun of right now, so I had to slip that in there. Um, so beyond cost and compliance, to me, one of the most interesting developments in infrastructure and cloud in general is that our operators are being asked to do more for their businesses, for their, their end users. So people expect their infrastructure now to be able to handle artificial intelligence, machine learning. Containers are really a, a given these days um, at various levels of the stack because of, of, of how powerful they can be. And people are starting to, to experiment with serverless. And so this is the world of, that operators live in right now. More pressure on cost and compliance, more pressure to deliver additional functionality in their clouds. And on top of the functionality piece, they're actually being asked to do it in more places. So cloud is no longer just about the data center. We're going to be hearing a lot more about Edge throughout this week. As Jonathan mentioned, we have uh, Edge 
keynotes and um, there's other, other content we'll be hearing from some folks that are leaders in the edge community um, later this morning, as a matter of fact. So when you put all of this together, one of the conclusions that I've come to that's a little different than perhaps we thought cloud was gonna turn out to be is that there's a myth, I believe, that cloud is consolidating, and I really think that that's, that's absolutely not what's happening. You know, we were told in the early days of cloud, it's just gonna be the lowest speed x86 chips, really cheap hard drives, scale out as far as the eye can see, and that's it, that's the beauty of cloud. And that's not the way things are playing out. You know, um, the ways in which cloud are diversifying are being driven by both hardware and software, and those are being driven by the demands of the applications and the workloads, right? And so, for example, um, if you just look at the hardware landscape, there's, of course, x86, still a, a huge uh, part of, of everybody's infrastructure, right? But GPUs are absolutely mainstream now. And it's not just for Bitcoin mining, believe it or not, um, or gaming. It's also for a lot of other applications, of course, um, HPC. And we're starting to see AI and machine learning uh, algorithms that are, can operate much faster on GPUs. And there are other architectures that are emerging as well that people are experimenting with, both at the edge and the data center in, ter in, in, in terms of things like FPGAs, other custom processors. You know, Google actually in, in, unveiled their third generation uh, Tensor processor unit um, a couple weeks ago, and, and people are starting to, to look at ARM again for, uh, for the server space. But really, I think the software is probably the biggest topic for the week here at an open source conference. And I thought it was really eye-opening when I looked at our schedule of, of topics. To me, this really tells the story of what life is like for an open uh, infrastructure operator. So we have um, more than 30 different open source projects, many from, from different communities that are being discussed this week. So why is that? Well, this is the way people are solving the hard problems when it comes to infrastructure and cloud. And so from the standpoint of an operator, this is also where the challenges come from. So they can, they can draw from this incredible uh, catalog or universe of things the builders out there are building to solve hard problems, and that's awesome. But putting that together is also the challenge, right? And so when we ask, you know, why is it that people are solving these problems in the open these days, it's really because it's the best way to solve problems. You know, scientists have been trying to tell us this for a long time, right? This is how science works, so why shouldn't computer science work the same way? And really, um, the broader point here is that one is not enough. One is never enough. You know, one, um, one cloud provider is not going to be enough to power the needs of, of infrastructure globally. Um, one open source project is not going to be enough. It's already not enough. You know, there's no one open source project that can possibly power a complete cloud with all the capabilities people expect today. And one foundation is not enough. So none of us should be thinking uh, with our blinders on in our silos about our piece all the time. We have to specialize, certainly, and build the components that we are good at, but we've got to keep looking at the big picture because that's what our operators need. And, and even with all of that open source, that powers and makes possible open infrastructure. The open source components are actually not enough either. And that's because turning open source into open infrastructure is not trivial. You have got to integrate and operate all of these pieces. And a lot of the speakers we'll be hearing from this morning are talking exactly about how we're trying to tackle this problem as a community and as an industry at large. And even beyond the technical challenges, if you think about it for a moment from the standpoint of these operators, they are not only consuming open source from, say, 30-plus projects and communities, trying to keep pace with that and understand what new releases are, trying to figure out kind of the nuances of the different communities, trying to participate. And that's a lot to ask of these operators. They're trying to, to deliver infrastructure we rely on. So, you know, we can't expect them to know every, every nuance of every community, right? For example, I mean, there's no way we could expect every operator out there of open infrastructure to know what kind of drink you're supposed to buy the sender team when you run into them, right? I mean, that's, that's just like absurd. Um, by the way, it's Fireball. <laughs> so that's one more you can check off your list, but hopefully by the end of the week you can, you can complete your bingo card. Um, 
So let's go back to who exactly is operating open infrastructure. So I talked about some, some big users earlier, mentioned the planes, trains, and automobiles, talked about the science, um, people that run open infrastructure for our benefit, as well as retail and, and finance. Um, and it's, it is true that there, the number of industries running open infrastructure is, is really impressive. And, you know, by the way, it's not just private cloud, it's also public cloud. So a lot of uh, dozens of public clouds all over the world are built on open infrastructure, and that gives people another model to consume, consume infrastructure. But I will let you in on one secret that I did recently discover, which is that logos actually don't operate infrastructure, as it turns out. It's people. So people actually operate the infrastructure. And if there's one thing that I would encourage you more than anything this week while you're here, is to get to know these people, learn from them, teach them, collaborate with them. These are the people that actually make open infrastructure happen. They are the ones putting together all these technologies and making something uh, more powerful out of it than, than each component on its own could ever be. For example, Joseph Sandoval, who I hope is out here somewhere, uh, and his team at the Adobe Marketing Cloud, um, they operate a, a cloud with over 100,000 cores with a team of four people. These are the four people, as it turns out. So this is your chance to meet them and learn from them. Um, another example would be Eli Elliott from Gap. So Gap is you know, a massive retailer. You know, they're operating um, a combination of different open source components for their infrastructure, OpenStack, Cloud Foundry, and other pieces. And the last person I want to mention is um, Ricardo from CERN. Now, Ricardo is, is somebody who is, again, working for this incredible organization that's driving innovation in infrastructure and other t forms of technology, pushing the limits. So when I tell you, you know, the time is, is right this week for you to spend time with people like this and learn from them, you know, I'm no different. I mean, I would do anything to spend five minutes with Ricardo and just pick his brain. I mean, this is hey, somebody Mark. that I know I could learn a lot from. Oh, hey. How are you doing? Well, this is, this is a weird coincidence. OK. <laughs> awesome. Well, welcome, Ricardo. Thank you. All right. So, so what, are you, what kind of stuff are you doing at CERN? So we are doing a lot of uh, container infrastructure, also OpenStack based on OpenStack. So we'll, we've been playing a lot with Federation these days. OK. So, yeah. Cool. Is there yeah. something you can show us? Yeah, maybe. Do you want to see a live demo? A live demo? Cool. Sure, why not? <laughs> Let's see. Live demos never crash, right? That should be fine. Exactly. So this is an example of uh, one of the applications we've been using recently, which is to try to process all, st all this data that you mentioned with these big machines we have. OK. Uh, so we are using Kubernetes, OpenStack Magnum, Manila, and uh, we'll try to, to do a demo of what, what we are using okay. here. So this is, uh, this will be live, so hope Live? Uh-oh. Yeah. So there we go. So this is running on real infrastructure out in the world. This is running from the CERN cloud. The CERN cloud, right now, OK. So, so I'll, I kind of scripted the, the text so that I don't lose too much time. But we can see here that we have a bunch of Kubernetes clusters. Mm -hmm. The three first ones uh, are deployed at CERN internally. And then we have one in T-Systems, which is an European cloud, public cloud based on OpenStack also. Uh -huh. And then we have one in GKE. OK, so the at each of the ones that say Atlas are referring to the CERN OpenStack private cloud. Yeah that you operate, and then you have Google Compute Engine, yep. or GKE, um, and uh, T-Systems. So yep. this is awesome. So you're leveraging all those different clouds. So what exactly. are we seeing So here? these are the three ones that, that we mentioned that are running at CERN. So for, okay. for this demo, I have three clusters of 20 nodes each. So the first thing we have to do is to create the federation. So we're, we're actually working to integrate this functionality into OpenStack Magnum so that we don't have to do this manually. For this demo, I, I already pre-created. So we can, see, we can see that we're starting with an empty federation, no clusters in. Like, well, that's no fun. Yeah. So the other thing we're also working on OpenStack Magnum is to automate the, the management of the federation inside. For the moment, this is still being reviewed, so we will use the native tools from Kubernetes. So let's add the first one. So we just added one cluster to our federation. OK. I'm adding a second one, because one is also not fun. <laughs> and let's see. So we have two here. So there we go. We just added two clusters to our federation, two separate clusters, Kubernetes okay. clusters deployed with OpenStack. So to, to start the demo, we'll use this tool that our physicists use to submit their workflows for data analysis. Sure, I'm very familiar with physicist tools. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. Who isn't? So we have a couple of examples here. So we, we have one analysis to kind of look for the Higgs boson. Sure, yeah, I mean, 
I'm sure you all look for the Higgs boson in your spare time. We also have dark matter. Dark matter, I don't know if we want to find that. And supersymmetry. Supersymmetry, OK. That's kind of scary, too. All right, let's, let's try to find the Higgs boson, should we? Let's go. Oops. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. No. <laughs> you know, uh, they made me promise not to make a black hole joke, but I feel like <laughs> maybe we might have made one. Um, Ah, wait, 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 we'll get it back. <laughs> this is live, you can see. Go, 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 go. Maybe we should have gone it's with coming, dark it's matter. Coming, it's coming, it's coming. Okay, you, he can see on the, uh, his command line that let's uh, go, let's go. So he's getting it go. going. Okay. So we'll try to submit this, this, um, this demo, so just to show that it's live. Okay. And then. So this will generate the workflows. It's submitting the workflow into this federation. Into this federation. Mm -hmm. so we, we'll, we'll have to wait a bit because the, these are complex workflows. So sure. we'll have to wait a couple of minutes. But we can see already that there's one job running there in this Atlas uh -huh. Recast X, the third from the top. So yep. we'll have to wait a bit that the workflow is submitted. OK, so just to, to give everybody a little bit uh, more background on this. So you're, you're talking a lot about federation. I noticed you got some, some Kubernetes commands in here, and we know you're running on some different clouds, OpenStack and Google powered clouds. Like what, what kind of federation are you talking about here? So these are, we, we have a lot of infrastructure inside CERN, but we need to expand our compute resources because we, are, we have these big detectors generating a petabyte a second that we can't handle, so then we filter Wait, it. a petabyte per second? Yeah, so we can't handle that, so we kind of filter okay, the insane. data. We filter the data to something like a couple of gigabytes a second, then we okay. can manage that. We're so still you got to throw most of the data away just because of yeah. physics. You guys know something about physics. Right? Exactly. Okay. And then we still store something like 70 petabytes a year, so it's still quite a lot of data. We need Ow. a lot of compute power to okay. process all of this. That's crazy. Um, so yeah, th so that's why we've been looking to, to use technologies that would allow us to rely on something that we could expand our cloud to, to the outside of CERN. So you're federating Kubernetes across multiple clouds. Is that, is that correct? That's it, yeah. OK. And so then you have this containerized workload, goes through your physics workflow engine, and um, oh, look, something's happening. There we go. So the, f the, the, um, the submission of the workflow uh, started. So we are using two of the clusters, the ones we, are, we added to the federation. We can see X and Y. Uh -huh. If you look carefully, the second one from the top is the federation. If you look at the UIDs, they correspond to uh, the same UIDs of the jobs in the clusters that are part of the federation. So one thing we can see, as we were saying, is that we have all these resources. You actually think in UUIDs, I guess. <laughs> That's scary. With time, it comes. Yeah. <laughs> so we mentioned we have these other clusters here that are uh -huh. not being used because we didn't add them to the federation. So let's give it a go. Uh, so let's add um, the third one that we have at CERN. OK. Let's add T systems, which is this public cloud, so external. Sure. This is not at CERN any longer. And the final one is, um, is GKE, as we mentioned. So let's do that. And we should now see that we have the five clusters there. And okay. now these jobs take a while. So it might be that it takes a couple of uh, seconds to, to show here. But hopefully, we'll, sh we'll see here. Okay, so we're now running this workload uh, for your physicists who are analyzing data, looking for the Higgs boson on five different clouds using Kubernetes, all through the, the magic of the software that you all have been able to, to integrate and build. Exactly. So there you go. We have jobs running on all the five clusters in this federation. Some That's amazing. Outside. Yep. Well, listen, I know it takes a few minutes. Thank you. Yeah, let's give him a round of applause. I only jinxed his demo a little bit, so it's not a big deal. Um, Listen, I know it takes a little while to actually discover whether this is going to find the Higgs boson. Do you want to show us this before we? Uh... Yeah, yeah. So here we we see the workflow is quite complex. Like physics is really complicated sometimes. So all these steps are individual jobs, and this is what's being submitted. Okay. So if we had one hour, we could wait for the result. But I okay. Guess so we don't have an hour, yeah. but I happen to know that Ricardo is doing some sessions later today and throughout the week. So maybe go to the session and find out if we actually found the Higgs boson this morning okay. live. Thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate you joining us. Yes. All right. Well, I love live demos, and uh, I was sweating a little bit, but it seemed like we, we got through. No black holes. 
Um, just to wrap things up, I want to point out one, one more thing about operators. You know, I've been talking about the operators that I'm inspired by, how they have unique challenges versus those of us who are, are on the build side, building the tools that they, that they put into to motion. But the fact is, it's really not one or the other. We have a lot of operators who are also builders. Uh, we often refer to them as super users, in fact. And some of these uh, are just amazing operators that what they've done is looked at all of the tools available, and they've found either ways to improve those to fit their use case, or in some cases, created new technology to fill those gaps, to make it easier to operate, to make it easier to make it repeatable. If you think about putting all those technologies together, even if you get it working right once, you want to be able to do it over and over and over again, upgrade it, lifecycle management uh, of that whole stack is a real challenge. And one example of some operators that are also builders are some folks from SKT and AT&T. They're starting a project this week, just kicking it off, called Airship. You can check it out at airshipit.org. And you know, one of the th great things about this community of developers and the, their focus is that the first thing they wanted to do to, to drive collaboration was create a Git repo inside the infrastructure that our community is, is uh, used to collaborating on. And they're already getting pull requests. And, and you can see some of the folks' names here. So it's really, again, all about the people. And if you are as inspired as I am by these operators that are changing the way infrastructures run, and you want to change the way you operate, I just want to welcome you to the community that builds and operates open infrastructure. Thank you.